Hello and welcome to the Immune System Optimization Webinar. My name is Dr. Kristen Spark. I'm a naturopathic doctor licensed to practice in Ontario, and I'm also the owner of Verger Wellness Clinic. Verger Wellness Clinic is a wellness clinic located in Uptown Waterloo. We're an interdisciplinary clinic. Uh, we have a variety of practitioners and we believe in helping our clients find their best health and ultimately personal growth. Um, so this webinar is all about the immune system. Today we are going to cover immune system, the basics. I want you to have an understanding of how the immune system actually works. We're going to talk about vaccines and immunity. And we're also going to talk about gut immune function because digestive health and gut health is critically important for having a healthy immune system. Um, and lastly, we're gonna talk about nutrient deficiencies and how those could be impacting the immune system um, as well. So just a disclaimer that this webinar um, is strictly for educational purposes. It is not intended as medical advice, treatment advice, or any treatment recommendations. The information at this time is also to, uh, accurate to the best of my knowledge and ability. Uh, we have to understand that information in medicine is always changing and that what I present today may not be uh, relevant or accurate in the months that come. Um, but at this point, this is um, as, as much as I know and that that is the best of my ability. So why are we talking about the immune system? Well, it's a great time of year to talk about immunity because we are in our colder seasons here in Ontario, Canada. Cooler weather does bring on um, and impact the seasonal levels of colds and flus and ultimately virus, virus rates. Um, we're also currently living through an infectious disease pandemic, so I feel it's very important to talk about optimal immunity. Um, autoimmune rates in North America are also on the rise, um, so we are seeing a ever increasing rate of autoimmune diseases in North Americans. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, but basically that is when the immune system goes awry and um, starts to self-target. Um, I also feel it's very important to, to, to talk um, about the immune system from a place of education because right now, especially in, in the current times, there is a lot of misinformation out there um, and we need to be very clear about what information is, is true um, coming from an evidence-based perspective. I also really believe in um, advocating for, for preventative medicine. Um, that is what Verger is all about. We are proactive practitioners rather than reactive disease focused. So we want our clients to be as uh, in the best health that they can be, not just free of disease. And lastly, um, I really love offering these webinars for free as an effort to increase access to complementary and alternative medicine, specifically naturopathic medicine, because I recognize not everyone has the uh, capability to see a naturopathic doctor for many reasons. So at this time of year, it, it is the fall. Um, it is cold and flu season. Um, and so why does that tend to, why do we see an uptick in cold and flu in these uh, colder months? Well, um, this is a time of, of just coming out of the allergy season. So ragweed being one of the most common allergens is really prominent between August and September. Um, and when we have allergies, there is more nasal inflammation. That nasal inflammation sets the stage for infectious uh, diseases like a virus to take up shop within the, the nasal tissue um, and to start and easily replicate. Um, so allergies can be one factor in why we see a big rise in infectious um, viral cold and flu. Um, additionally, colder temperatures, that is definitely the preferred um, environment for viral replication. Um, cooler air irritates those nasal passages and the pharyngeal passages, so between the nose and, and the mouth. Um, and that can also sort of set the stage and create a, a hospitable environment for um, a virus. Additionally, it's back to school season. We are uh, definitely seeing just simply because kids are going indoors and they're around you know, 30, 20 to 30 other individuals um, that that can be a factor in why we see cold and flu season at this time. Um, 
And then we also have to think about uh, dietary and lifestyle factors. So uh, the standard American diet is really not rich in vitamins and minerals and antioxidants. And so if we have a poor um, diet, that can be a factor as well as a stressful lifestyle, which stress does impact the immune system as well. So um, that is why at this time of year, it's really important to start talking about the immune system. So stress, currently um, we know that the pandemic is influencing mental health substantially. There have been uh, significant, statistically significant increases in um, drug overdose, suicide, and antidepressant medication prescriptions. So as indicators of mental health, um, we can see that there's been some huge increases in, in mental health concerns um, related to the pandemic. Not only that, but we're also seeing uh, increased rates of depression, anxiety, and burnout. Those are, are quite prominent in many people that are, are living through a pandemic right now. Um, I've also noticed in my practice that there's been an uptick in insomnia, hormonal problems, and digestive disturbances, which are very much connected to the stress response. Um, the big issue with stress is that it suppresses the immune system. Um, and that is not ideal when we need to have an immune system that is robust and, and really well functioning. So stress and immunity. Um, when you're in a state of stress, your body is in uh, what's called sympathetic tone. So that is the fight or flight mode of the nervous system. Um, so there's typically more production of things like adrenaline or norepinephrine. Uh, we would also see increased levels of, of stress hormones such as cortisol being produced. Uh, when we have high stress, we see high output of cortisol from the adrenal gland. Cortisol down regulates the immune function by, re by reducing inflammatory mediators. So cortisol actually dampens down um, inflammation and the little chemical signals of the inflammatory response. And so typically we think, oh, less inflammation, that's a good thing. However, when it comes to the immune system, we need those inflammatory mediators to signal to our body that there's a problem. So if we are just dampening that down and suppressing those signals, our body can't sense that there's a virus that's come in contact with our nose tissue. And so we are not getting the, the, the proper immune um, responds occurring because stress is really just shutting that, that um, inflammatory intermediate signals down. Chronic cortisol output, which is what I see in people that are experiencing burnout and exhaustion and adrenal phase three depletion, um, can actually cause chronic inflammation. So when we're dealing with an acute stress response and a chronic stress response, the immune system and the inflammatory signals um, have, have, it's very different between those two phases. Um, additionally, stress um, and the immune system are connected in Chinese medicine. So traditional Chinese medicine, which is TCM uh, for short on my slide, TCM um, at this time of year really talks about the lung qi, so the energy of, of the lung organ meridian. Um, at this time of year, we are in the season of the lung, um, and the lung really controls immunity in Chinese medicine. The lung also controls um, skin, so that's part of you know, in Chinese medicine, the um, getting sweaty and having a fever is part of the body's way of trying to push um, a pathogen or um, a virus, for example, out of the body. Um, in Chinese medicine, lung qi is also associated with sadness and grief. And at this time of year, um, September, October, we tend to experience um, some, some, some sadness. It's the end of the summertime. Our seasons are changing, our leaves are turning, and, and we're seeing you know, some vegetative death all around us, it can bring up some sadness and some grief. Um, it's also a, a time when we may um, start to see people become more sick and that's affecting the lung chi as well. Um, stress and immunity also another important piece to talk about is sleep. So when somebody is going through a stress response, there often is insomnia. And we know that when people are sleeping, we're um, getting really good production of melatonin and human growth hormone. 
And without the production of those very key hormones in the body, um, we can't repair our body tissues as easily. So stress impacting sleep can impact immune system simply because you're not able to recover and repair your body tissues um, at night when you know you should be with good amounts of melatonin being produced by the pineal gland, and then also a good amount of uh, growth hormone being secreted at nighttime. All right, so we're gonna talk about the immune system basics. All right, so this is um, a nice image that gives you a sense of all of the tissues that are involved in controlling the immune system. Um, so the immune system really starts in the bone marrow. Bone marrow is where we would see hematopoiesis. So that's red blood cell production, as well as white blood cell production. Um, and so our, our white blood cells are very key for our immune system function and they come from our bones. We also have um, the thymus, which is a, um, an interesting organ. It's very large when you're uh, a newborn baby, but it actually regresses and shrinks in size as we age. Um, and the thymus is involved in, in uh, the adaptive immune system and the innate immune system. And it's, it really helps a young, uh, infant have a robust immune system as that immune system is developing. We also have lymph nodes and lymphatic vessels, and we'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, they're really not talked about enough, in my opinion, but they're basically how we um, move fluid through our body, and our lymph nodes are hot spots where we would uh, get lymph, uh, lymphocyte production, so really important white blood cell that's involved in uh, infection fighting. A tonsils are a nice example of, of lymphatic tissue that people are familiar with. You've, if you've had strep throat, you've had really inflamed, red, swollen tonsils in the past, and you've maybe needed antibiotics to deal with that infection. Um, but those tonsils are a very key immune system tissue. Unfortunately, we get them removed way too often um, but there, that's, that's just an example of some tissue that you might be familiar with. And then we have the spleen, which is involved in breaking down blood cells and controlling uh, different cellular components of our immune system. And so there's a lot of, of tissues and organs that are working together to create um, a system that is always on surveillance. So this is the uh, lymphatic system. So we have lymph nodes, as you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, there's um, those lymph nodes, they are really surrounding our arteries and veins in our body. So it looks almost like, uh, on the right-hand side, it looks like a diagram of your arteries and your veins in your body, but in fact, that's actually lymphatic vessels and lymph nodes. So they're all over the whole body. Uh, those tonsils are, are sort of an example that people are really familiar with. But you also have lymph nodes that are below your mandible. Those can become inflamed if people are feeling sick or having a sore throat. Um, you have lymph nodes in your groin, which can sometimes become inflamed if there's an infection in the lower half of the body. Uh, lymph nodes in the armpits, lymph nodes above the clavicle, they are everywhere. Um, and they're really basically here to help make lymphocytes. Lymphocytes being a really key white blood cell um, that's used to help find and fight infections. We also have other organs that are involved in the immune system. Um, so we've got the gut, which we're going to talk um, more about it later in the presentation, but also ear, nose, and throat. Um, so your nose has your your nose hairs are there to help keep debris out. You've got mucus um, membranes within those tissues that are sort of monitoring the environment and and noticing if there's any viruses or bacteria that are not in check or that shouldn't be there. Um, our lungs have their own set of immune uh, their own immune tissue and and lymphatic vessels. Uh, we have the lymphatic system, which runs throughout the whole body. Uh, we also have the skin and the eyes, which are other hot spots for, um, for different types of immune function. The skin is one that people often forget about. We actually have a bacteria on the skin and the pH of the skin is really important for maintaining that healthy immune system function of the skin. 
Um, so we really want to be cautious with the products that we're putting on our skin to make sure that they are pH appropriate um, so that we are keeping that skin in, in its optimal state um, and so that we have good bacteria levels on the skin as well. The lymphatic system is really interesting. It actually doesn't have a, a pump like the heart with uh, our arteries and vein system, our cardiovascular system. Um, so the lymphatic system depends on movement to help pump that system. Um, and that is sometimes a bit of a problem for people that are more sedentary and don't have much movement. They don't do much walking um, where we can end up seeing edema developing. So um, swelling and fluid retention and in, in usually within the feet um, and the lower legs. And that's just a sign that that lymphatic system is not moving that fluid well and uh, that that person needs extra lymphatic support. Why do people have a low, lowered immunity? So what are some factors for having low immune system function? So chronic disease is one of the big ones, um, specifically metabolic diseases like diabetes and um, cardiovascular disease. Um, also hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism basically presents with a, a lowered metabolism. Um, so there's just overall, these systems are, are working slower or less optimally. Um, and that, that can be a factor for low immune, uh, a low immune function. Autoimmunity is another one, especially pe people that are on uh, medications for their autoimmune disease, like TNF alpha blockers, for example, those can really impact the immune system's function and they may be more prone to infections. Um, lung conditions like COPD, for example, where it's an, a chronic obstructive pul pulmonary disease, so we're not getting good um, release and exhalation. There's actually air that's kind of stuck in those lungs, and that's of course, the lungs need to be refreshed and have good airflow and, and also good blood flow in order to have optimal immunity. CF, so cystic fibrosis, is a condition where we would see um, changes in the hydration of different tissues that can definitely impact um, immune function, especially within the lungs and the digestive system. Um, if someone is immunocompromised, so again, if they're on some of those medications that, that create immunocompromise, um, or if maybe there's a, um, a, a, a cancer or a white blood cell deficiency, um, I would even say somebody that's got, you know, low iron level that has low hemoglobin and low neutrophil count, so neutropenia due to low iron, you could really think that that person's immunocompromised because the neutrophils are so important for finding infection, basically identifying a pathogen and then signaling to fight that infection. Um, and cancer, of course, there's, there's many issues with cancer, but low immune system is, is one of those. Um, other factors for low immunity. So we talked about some of those autoimmune conditions, but there are other medications that can lower immunity. Um, for example, metformin lowers the level of B12 in the body. B12 is a critical nutrient for red blood cell and white blood cell formation. So if someone is um, nutrient depleted due to a medication, there could be immuno uh, insufficiency as well. Um, additionally, lifestyle. So when there's high stress, we talked about that, how that can dampen down the inflammatory mediators. Um, alcohol intake. Alcohol also suppresses the immune function. Um, smoking, impacting lung health, impacting the, the cilia um, within the lungs and the bronchi, when the cilia are the hairs that help to sweep up any toxins and debris and mucus that gets into the lungs. Uh, when you smoke, those cells, those cilia hair cells, um, they, they die. So they can't cleanse and clear the lungs as effectively. Um, exercise is another one. We talked about how that lymphatic system doesn't have a pump to really move the fluids on its own. So if someone is not exercising and is sedentary, that's a factor. Um, and then diet, because nutrients are so important for a healthy immune system to function well. Um, we have to think about diet. And then lastly, age. So as we get older and um, elderly people are more prone to infections because of some of these other factors, there may be diseases 
um, or com comorbidities. There may, are, they, there may be medications. Um, there's changes in the thyroid function. There often is change with blood flow and activity level. So just age alone is a factor for um, lowered immunity as well, unfortunately. We like to think of the immune system as uh, our defense system. So there's a bunch of different aspects of that defense system. We may have um, some police officers patrolling the body. We may have some uh, snipers that are kind of watching and, and waiting to attack. Um, there's many, I, I think about this as a bunch of different key players in a, a defense system. And we'll go a little, a little deeper with that. So um, there's two main branches of the immune system. You've got your innate immune system and your adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is um, what we're born with at birth. It is very fast, it is naive, and it is less specific. So what that means is that it is a rapid acting immune system that doesn't have any memory. It sees a problem and it fights a problem very quickly and it calls in for um, backup. It's the innate immune system that primes the adaptive immune system and gives us that immune memory, which is really important. Um, so the innate immune system is made up of things like mast cells, dendritic cells, uh, natural killer cells, neutrophils, which I talked about with the iron deficiency, um, and macrophage. Um, so these are just examples of, of different cells, part of that key uh, defense system that is part of our um, innate immune system. The adaptive immune system, on the other hand, has memory. So this is that memory is created by B cells and T cells and antibodies, as well as T regulatory cells. So those cells are, are more specific. They're, they're, I like to think of these guys as the snipers and the innate immune system as like a shotgun approach. The innate immune system is there. It's going to just blast and fight anything that it senses is a problem, whereas the adaptive immune system has memory, it knows what it's looking for, and it targets that very specifically, like say a sniper would. Um, so again, I'm using this analogy of a defense system with different key components, because it just helps to wrap your brain around all of the different players and the different um, aspects of the system. Um, memory is really important because memory is what um, allows vaccines to work. Um, so our second topic is vaccines. Um, basically with a vaccine, we inject an antigen. So an antigen is a trigger. An antigen could be a virus, a bacteria, could be a parasite. It could be really any substance that the immune system is responding to. Um, with a vaccine, we inject an antigen and then that induces an immune reaction. So the immune system, the, the innate immune system sees that antigen, that virus, for example, and it signals to the adaptive immune system that we need to make antibodies to the antigen. And that causes an inflammatory reaction. We have to have inflammation if we're going to mount a proper immune response. Um, it's just part of the process. You get different cytokines, um, things like TNF alpha and interleukin six, um, interleukin one. These are inflammatory cytokines and different mediators that signal to the immune system that there's actually a problem that needs to be addressed. Um, that inflammatory reaction, as, as I mentioned, signals to the adaptive immune system that we need B cells, we need T cells. Ultimately, we need memory. We need to know and recognize the antigen that was put into our body, um, typically by an injection. So next time you come in contact with a substance that the, the body will then know how to mount an appropriate immune response to help clear that pathogen out of the body. That is the whole point of the vaccines. It, it just amplifies the um, speed and the effectiveness of the immune system's response. There's different kinds of vaccines. And I think this is important to talk about. Um, so there's live attenuated vaccines. A live attenuated vaccine basically means that it is, uh, so if we were to take 
influenza virus, for example, the virus is live, but it's been attenuated. It's been changed um, in some small way. Um, and that is what is injected into the body. We also have inactivated and killed or killed um, vaccines such as polio or pertussis. So we're injecting polio um, into the body, but it's been inactivated, it's been killed. So it doesn't cause disease, but the structure is there. So the immune system can memorize the structure. There's also toxoid vaccines. So this is what we would see in diphtheria and tetanus, which do create toxins. And that's what causes a lot of the disease symptoms with tetanus and diphtheria. So rather than injecting um, the microbe, we're injecting the toxoid, the toxin. Um, and allowing the immune system to respond to that. Um, we also have subunit purified. So what that means is they take a small portion, a little subunit of um, hepatitis B, for example, and inject that into the body. And then lastly, our, our newest type of vaccine is the mRNA vaccine, as we've seen with COVID. And um, that is... We're going to go a little a, a little bit deeper on that one. So mRNA vaccines are um, mRNA is is a basically it's a it's a form of um, it's genetic material that is signaling and and giving instructions for protein translation. So you have DNA, RNA, and then protein, and so the RNA codes and signals instructions for the proteins that are needed in the immune system. So again, these coded proteins signal to an innate immune system that creates an inflammatory response and that inflammatory response causes immune memory. Now the immune system, the adaptive immune system has the B cells, has the T cells. We have the antibodies to say, next time I come in contact with that um, specific protein instruction, I'm going to fight it. Um, and that's, that's the, the rationale about how these things work. Um, immune memory really means we've got a faster and more re specific response to a substance or a microbe um, or a virus. The immune system is primed, so it's ready to go. It can see things much faster and target them much faster. And ultimately, immune memory also means that there's less viral load um, when we're talking about viruses um, and, and therefore less replication. So what does viral load really mean? It's if you get infected, the virus replicates inside your body and there's uh, it builds up a load of virus uh, um, within, within one person. When we have a vaccine, we have reduced viral load, which means that there is less infectiousness and less community spread, and that we also have less severity of outcomes of a disease because the virus can't get, it can't grow to a level where it causes significant severe issues because the immune system memory is targeting that and is getting on top of it fast. And that's the beauty of the adaptive immune system. Um, we know that COVID-19 vaccines are reducing the rates of death, they're reducing the rates of ICU cases, and they're reducing the need for ventilation in hospitals. So that does tell us that the severity of the disease is decreased when we are um, when in vaccinated people. The reduced viral load may also mean that there is less likelihood of long haul COVID. Long haul COVID being um, so after the infection has actually cleared, lingering multi-system involvement. Um, so this is a new area of research. It's really not being talked about a lot um, in the mainstream media, in my opinion, um, but it is a significant problem. And basically these people that do have long haul COVID, they've had um, multi-system involvement. So it might be neurological, musculoskeletal, um, there could be gastrointestinal and it's lingering symptoms that may go on for weeks or months um, that are in some cases very debilitating and, and changing the quality of life absolutely um, after a COVID infection. And that might be a severe COVID infection, but that could also be a minor COVID infection. So less viral load means typically less infectiousness and less severity and less may, may mean less likelihood of long haul COVID. 
All right, so the immune system, it is a coordinated interplay of cells. Um, so here's a, a diagram that um, is specific for SARS-CoV-2, so COVID-19, and um, just how it works within the body. So basically you come in contact with um, a virus, typically through respiratory droplets, that's the most common route of infection um, that causes your innate immune system to branch off and start to send signals to um, the adaptive immune system, we get colonial expansion of these different types of T cells, and that signals to B cells that we need antibodies. That also signals um, that to a different portion of the immune system, a CD4 positive T cell, that we actually need to clear the infection, and that's kind of a different, a different side of the immune system. So when we're thinking about how a vaccine works, we would see that colonial expansion, B cell proliferation, and then antibody production as well. All right, moving on to topic number three, this is the gut immune system function. Um, I love gut health, that is my focus area in my practice, um, because I truly think that digestive health and gut health is involved in essentially every disease. Did you know that 70% of your immune system cells reside within your gut? Um, so although we often think of our immune system as our throat and our nose and our lungs, it's actually 70% of your immune cells are, are surrounding and within your digestive system, which is, is crazy. <laughs> um, I like this uh, little comic. So the Human Microbiome Project says that the human body has 100 trillion microscopic life forms living in it. Um, and then of course the bacteria that are all overcrowded living on top of each other say, you call this living? <laughs> Maybe it's a nerdy joke, but I love it. Um, so we have trillions and trillions of, of bacterial cells within our body. And that makes up our microbiome. So the microbiome, if you haven't heard this term before, you gotta get familiar with it because it's a huge area of research and it's really cutting edge as far as healthcare goes. Uh, but a microbiome are the microorganisms that make up a specific environment. And when we talk about the human microbiome, we're talking about the biome that is, um, the microbiome that is within the digestive system primarily, but also on our skin, in our eyes, our ears, our nose, our throat, we've got um, bacteria basically on every living surface, uh, living on every surface of our body. So it is a whole ecosystem. The majority of those bacterial cells, those microbiological cells are um, within the gut. That's a big, that's, that's a hot spot. By now in 2015, uh, it is familiar fact that humans have more bacterial cells um, than human cells. Again, really weird to wrap your mind around that, but it is uh, a really cool fact. Bacteria live on the skin, they live in the ears and the nose, and most of all, they live in the gut, um, says Helen Fields from John Hopkins Medicine. Here's a picture of some thick layer of bacteria growing on a tumor in the colon. Um, interesting to see this type of image and get a sense of how this may look under a microscope. Um, here's some other images of, of different commensal organisms. So um, commensal meaning that these are normal, they're found on everybody's body, um, and that they are not necessarily pathogenic, so disease-causing bacteria. They also kind of look like this. This is a different image. Um, they also may look like this. Again, different type of imaging, um, but you can get a sense that there's a lot of, of variety. There's a lot of quantity. Um, it's a really, uh, there, there's a lot of communication between these bacterial cells. So they're not just hanging out along for the ride. They are communicating with our immune system every minute of every day. So the microbiome is made up of the good guys, the beneficial flora, um, but also potentially the bad guys. Um, so the bad guys are what we may classify as um, dysbiotic bacteria, so stuff that is not ideal, um, or pathogenic bacteria. So bacteria or parasites or yeast or even viruses um, that cause disease. Those are pathogens. Dysbiotic 
um, bacteria or microbes could be any of the, those types of microbes. So uh, the big four are yeast, parasites, bacteria, and viruses. The good bacteria are really important for health. Um, so I, here on the right upper corner is a picture of um, the enteric mucosal membrane. So it's the membrane in your gut and you can see um, there's little, uh, little uh, epithelial cells that have sort of these finger-like projections. And right on top of those fingers on the upper image, you can see all of the, um, it, it's a graphic image, but you can see just the different types of bacteria that are residing right on that membrane itself. So they're very much communicating with our, our immune system. Um, the benefits of beneficial bacteria. Um, so why do we like these, these good guys? Well, they're um, really important for maintaining the pH of that ecosystem. So the acidity of the ecosystem. We actually like a more acidic um, intestine environment rather than an alkaline intestine environment. And that gets confusing because people have heard, oh, alkaline is good. I, you know, I, it sh we should be alkaline. Well, no, we actually um, should be acidic in some tissues of our body, like our vaginal tissue, our colonic and intestine uh, microbiome, and even our skin. We also like the good guys because um, they are mucus producing and they help to inc increase motility. So that keeps the system moving and protects us by creating a mucus layer over that um, membrane. We also like these good guys because they make um, they, they make chemical signals that are beneficial to our health. Um, so for example, lactic acid, they may also make things like oxalic acid, especially from yeast, which may not be, uh, you know, the level of that oxalic acid is, um, or oxalates can be problematic. They also may influence cytokine production, which it's cytokines that are the signals to the immune system. Um, the good guys also create short chain fatty acids that are very important for the health of our intestines like butyrate. They also modulate our hunger hormones, ghrelin and leptin. They also can modulate hormones uh, like estrogen. They may cause estrogen recycling um, where we're actually not detoxing the estrogen through feces and it's being reabsorbed um, through bacterial beta glucuronidase production. So. Um, which is not what we want. Um, so having good bacteria there helps the estrogen actually clear out of the body. Um, and at a cellular level, they're influencing the health of the enterocytes um, and helping to keep the other microbes in check. Ultimately, the beneficial bacteria modulate the immune system through the GALT. And the GALT is the gut-associated lymphatic tissue. So here's a picture, give you a visual. Um, you can see those little finger-like projections, those um, epithelial cells, and you can see around those epithelial cells, there's these M cells. Those M cells are sensing and detecting and picking up the, the me, me, um, chemical soup <laughs> of information that the bacteria are producing, and that signals to the immune system to, um, through that lymphoid follicle, to send out plasma cells and then ultimately to send out antibodies. So that is another adaptive immune system function where it is keeping um, the health of that membrane in check. We can test this stuff, which is really cool. We can actually check and see, okay, how much beneficial flora is there? Do I have lactic acid producing bacteria that is at a good level? Do I have uh, enough butyrate? being produced um, in, this, in the intestine environment. Uh, we can do this by a number of different types of tests. So there's um, DNA, PCR, so poly polymerase chain reactivity, which looks for DNA fragments. We can do stool culture and sensitivity testing. We can do ova and parasite checking. So to check for protozoal or helminthic parasites, so worms or little cellular protozoa parasites, um, using PCR and microscopy. We can check for pathogens. We can look for things like E. coli and Listeria and Salmonella, Campylobacter. Um, we can check for all of that, which is really cool. 
We also, um, when we're looking at the microbiome and we're looking at digestive health, we can get information about um, inflammatory markers. So if someone is um, really inflamed and that is related to a bacterial infection or um, a disease like ulcerative colitis or Crohn, we, Crohn's disease, we can check for those markers. We can check on the types of bacteria, if there's any yeast present, any parasite infections or any viruses that might be um, living within the digestive system. We can look at the level of short chain fatty acid production, so how much butyrate. And we can also check out um, secretory IgA. So secretory IgA is an antibody that is the first line of defense of that intestine. It's really important in surveilling and keeping the system healthy. Um, Cause when you think about it, your digestive system, your gut is exposed to the outside world. So as you swallow and you consume food that goes through a hollow tube from mouth to anus, and that is really exposed to the outside world. Whereas our other organs like our heart and our liver and our kidneys does not get exposure to the outside world. So we need to have this really robust immune system and this self-assessment system to make sure that that outside uh, world through our digestive system is, is not causing infection and not causing disease. So that brings me to autoimmunity. Um, so there are specific types of bacteria that are now in new research being associated with specific autoimmune diseases. Um, this is a, a, a new research target, um, but definitely lots of growing connections, which is um, very interesting because it gives us another way to think about autoimmunity. Um, so basically the bacteria that we've, that we've kind of talked about how bacteria influence that immune system through um, those M cells, through the gut associated lymphatic tissue, that um, milieu of signals that are, are um, interplaying with each other within the gut, that influences, influences the immune system. And when we have some dysbiotic or even pathogenic bacteria that are there for a long time, that, or a short time in some cases, um, that can cause uh, the immune system to go awry. So, and that's through a process called molecular mimicry, where let's say we have Klebsiella, for example, Klebsiella bacteria, uh, a very inflammatory type of bacteria. So the um, type of signals that it makes in the gut are very inflammatory. And generally inflammation is good, but when we have unrelenting strong inflammatory signals that can cause an immune reaction and we keep mounting an immu immune reaction. Over time, the bacteria um, proteins may become mistaken for something like cartilage uh, within the fingers or a, a different joint, for example, in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so that is this molecular mimicry where the molecules of the bacteria are being confused for your own tissue and your immune system starts to self-target. This is one hypothesis um, and, and as I mentioned, a new area of research for autoimmunity. Basically the, the antibodies are mistaking the body tissues for pathogens and they're targeting the, your own tissue. Um, which is not great. And these connections are being drawn in diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, ulcerative colitis, reactive arthritis is a really good example where there's an infection and it causes a re, uh, an arthritis in a different joint. That's a reactive arthritis, Hashimoto's, um, ankylosing spondylitis and multiple sclerosis all have connections to different bacterial um, types and levels. Um, here's an example of a research article uh, this came out in 2013, uh, 2014, uh, sorry, 2013. And um, it talks about that microbial infection and in rheumatoid arthritis. So just an example of this is an area of research. It is uh, really kind of cutting edge within the last 10 years or so. Um, and it's something that I love to focus on with patients that do have autoimmunity because it is something that, that we can modify. We can identify those bacteria types and we can work on modifying the microbiome. Why else might we be seeing a rise in autoimmunity? 
Um, well, it definitely does have to do with our diet. So we've got um, in the Western, this the standard American diet, the Western diet, um, you can see just based on that pyramid at the top of the pyramid, um, so the most abundant types of foods, we're seeing a lot of processed food, red, red meats, um, pre-packaged foods, sugary things like cupcakes. Um, there are not a lot of fruit and vegetables. And as you can see by that arrow that's pointing upwards, the more that we have that highly refined, processed, inflammatory food intake, the more likely we've got microbiota dysbiosis. And so that worsens as the, um, the pyramid, uh, as the food intake favors more of that inflammatory type of food. Whereas on the flip side, using a Mediterranean um, diet as an example, the bottom of the period, pyramid is fruits and vegetables. So that makes up the majority of the diet. We also see that the next layer is um, plant-based proteins and whole grains, nuts and seeds, that we have smaller levels of things like eggs and dairy and, and fish and meats and very, very small amounts of processed food, treats, desserts, et cetera. Um, and with that, we would see better microbio, uh, microbiome health. Um, there is a study that came out of a uh, university in California that said that the, the um, for microbiome optimal health, people need to be eating 30 different plant-based foods every week, which is a lot. I've tried to get to 30. You have to work on it. You will be surprised how many you are, um, how many you are not consuming when you start counting. So diet alone and the types of foods influence the microbiome, influence the bacteria, and that bacteria influences our immune system. When things are going wrong for a long enough time, we can develop autoimmunity where we have self-targeting immune system, and that's a problem. Lastly, our fourth topic is nutrient deficiencies. So um, some of the big ones, vitamin A, B, C, D, and E, um, and then our minerals, so zinc, iron, selenium, and copper. Vitamin A. Vitamin A is found in brightly colored orange, yellow, and green vegetables. Examples would be carrots, squash, sweet potatoes, spinach, and parsnips. Um, there are also high amounts of vitamin A in organ meat, like liver. And um, basically the, the excuse me, the carotenoids that are in the, those orange, yellow, and green veggies are turned into retinoids, and it's the retinoids that um, are the vitamin A. So you have beta carotene precursors, and then you have your vitamin A retinoids. Um, vit vitamin A is an antioxidant. It's a really important um, antioxidant for immune system, and it's involved in cellular development. So that helps to increase the amount of immune cells. Vitamin A is also used um, as a therapeutic intervention in, uh, in uh, severe cases of acne, and that's Accutane. That's a retinoid, a topical retinoid. And vitamin A is fat soluble. So you always wanna be eating these vegetables with a source of fat to help absorb that fat soluble vitamin. B vitamins. So there's a lot of different B vitamins. They're involved in many different reactions in the body. They help to form red blood cells. They're a cofactor for neurotransmitter and hormone production. They play a major role in detoxification through their ability to um, support methylation processes. They're also critically important for cell division and DNA synthesis. So you can get a sense that they are very important. Um, they are foundational for having healthy cellular function. We get lots of B vitamins from whole foods, such as nuts and seeds, beans and legumes, some fruits and vegetables, eggs, meat, and fish. Um, there are commonly deficiencies in vegetarians and vegans, especially with B12, um, because you really only get B12 from animal products um, like eggs, meat, and fish. And we also see B vitamins in people that are on a low carb uh, keto diet or a gluten-free diet because a lot of grain products, bread products are fortified with riboflavin and, and thiamine. So um, some B vitamins. And so when we don't have that fortification or we're cutting out all of our carbs, we may not be getting enough B vitamin, um, B1, 2, and possibly even B3. Uh, we also would see B vitamin deficiencies in picky eaters. 
um, and people that eat the standard American diet that's got a lot of those refined carbs, a lot of processed food, a lot of red meat, and not um, a lot of plant material. B vitamins are water soluble, so that means that they don't build up to a toxic level in the body, it's at least not um, easily like vitamin A would. Um, and so they do kind of flush through the system, but they are, are water soluble. Um, so they're processed out through the kidneys. Vitamin C, also another water soluble vitamin. Uh, vitamin C is known to reduce the duration and the severity of common cold symptoms. It's been really well studied for that. Um, it's an antioxidant, it's citric acid, and it's involved in phagocytosis. So basically cleaning up cellular debris after the fact. Um, it's also involved in cell repair and energy. You need that for mitochondrial function and you need that for uh, repair of tissues and cells. We get high amounts of vitamin C in foods like oranges and lemons, so citrus fruits. We also get high amounts in strawberries, kiwi, papaya, guava, um, broccoli, potatoes, bell pepper, and kale. People don't always think of the vegetables for vitamin C, but potatoes and broccoli are a really good source. Vitamin D. So um, a big topic, um, as we have seen deficiencies correlating to worsened COVID outcomes. Um, so I really recommend everybody gets their vitamin D checked at this time of the year, because that is, this is, this is the time that you want to know what your level is as we're going into those darker days. Um, so vitamin C is created by UV ray um, hitting the skin and then uh, converting into active vitamin D. We need to have enough sunlight in order to get that conversion happening. And you need to have enough sunlight on, on, on exposed skin without sunscreen, uh, which is a factor for kids, especially. Um, vitamin D is really important for lung function, lung, lung immunity. So that makes total sense with COVID. We would uh, really see a lot of lung involvement with that. Uh, disease. Deficiencies are associated, associated with worsened infectious diseases, including COVID-19. And I did write um, a peer-reviewed article by JAMA um, that you can reference if you're interested in the data. Um, they are, deficiencies are very common in northern latitudes just simply because there's not a lot of sun exposure and it's colder, a colder climate, so we're not exposing our skin um, in the middle of winter. This is a fat soluble vitamin as well. So you wanna take vitamin D with a source of food, a source of fat. And lastly for the vitamins is vitamin E. Um, so vitamin E is an antioxidant. It's a really important antioxidant for cell membrane function. Um, it keeps our cells fluid and, and uh, works as an antioxidant within the membrane. Our good sources from food are almonds and sunflower seeds, hazelnuts, um, plant oils, and wheat germ. And vitamin E is really important for wound healing. It's included in a lot of skin scar um, formulas for its wound healing support. Um, it's also got anti-aging benefits, um, but ultimately it's really important for repair and for cell membrane function. And it's fat soluble as well. So now we're into the minerals. Um, iron, we get uh, iron. I mentioned earlier that iron is really important for hemoglobin production, red blood cell formation, which carries oxygen throughout the body. You need enough iron for neutrophil production, so white blood cell production. We get iron from um, animal, meat, animal proteins and um, some plant foods. So meats, poultry, fish, and seafood are um, have some of the highest concentrations per quantity, but we also get iron in things like kidney beans, spinach, and molasses. So we want to inc include a variety of those iron sources, both heme iron from the animals and um, non-heme iron from the plant sources. Iron is always best taken with a source of vitamin C that does help absorption of iron. Zinc, really important for um, repair, wound, healing, immune function. We get the highest concentration of zinc is in oysters. So if you like oysters, go for it. Um, if you're not big into oysters or they're not high on your list, pumpkin seeds are a really good um, source of zinc as well. And also organ meat um, is quite high in zinc. So liver and kidney. Organ meat is also high in copper. I'll include uh, that. I didn't include that in the slides. So 
um, zinc and copper need to be consumed together to have proper balance of those two minerals. So you don't just want to supplement with zinc ongoing because that can cause a copper deficiency over the long term. Um, copper is found in nuts and seeds, um, specifically almonds and sesame seeds have a high amount. And then lastly, selenium. So one of our highest concentrations is in Brazil nuts from a plant-based source, um, but also high, uh, found in high amounts in organ meat and um, muscle, muscle meat. Um, so I recommend a diverse diet. I think it's best when we are consuming a variety of different proteins, a variety of plant foods, getting lots of nuts and seeds and legumes, beans, chickpeas, lentils, kidney beans for iron. Uh, we need to have enough variety in order to get all of these important nutrients. If we're eating the same thing every day or every week, we are not getting enough variety. So count your fruits, your vegetables, your nuts, your seeds, your grains, and your legumes. Are you getting up to 30? We know 30 is a really important number for microbiome ver, um, diversity. So I challenge you to see if you're getting close to 30. We can test for nutrients. So the, definitely we can check that out with blood testing. Um, naturopathic doctors in Ontario can check blood tests for many nutrients as well as white blood cells, uh, red blood cells, immune system markers, inflammatory markers, and more. Um, monitoring the status of these key nutrients annually is a best practice for those who are at risk of the vitamin and mineral deficiency due to diets, such as vegetarians and vegans, or people that do have a history of a deficiency. I think it's best to be proactive and that running um, some annual blood tests to check for nutrient sufficiency is a good practice that more people should be doing. So how to eat well for immune system. So overall, we wanna eat whole foods that are locally grown and organic whenever possible. We wanna add more spices, warming foods, soups and broths and root vegetables at this time of year. Um, we wanna transition away from things like salads and smoothies and um, raw pressed, pressed, cold pressed juices, um, especially if you're fighting um, a cold or a flu at, the, at this time. Um, and that's because energetically speaking, they're cold and they're damp and what your immune system and your lung chi really needs is more warmth and more energetic movement throughout the body to support the immune system. Uh, we wanna get plenty of fruits and vegetables. It does not matter if they're fresh or frozen. You wanna get a variety. So eating the same five vegetables, you know, broccoli, lettuce, peppers, onions, uh, potatoes is not enough. You need to get more variety. Um, so aiming for that 30 is a goal and they can be frozen. That's totally fine. Get a variety of lean proteins. So I do, um, I do mean some animal proteins because they're really high sources of zinc and copper. Um, but if you are a vegan or a vegetarian that make sure you are getting a wide variety of your um, vegan protein. So different beans, different legumes, different whole grains, different nuts and seeds, just depending on alternative fake tofu based, all, you know, fake meats um, is not enough. You need those other plant foods in order to get all of the nutrients and make sure you're getting enough of them if you're not eating um, some, some meats or animal proteins. You want to limit sugar and alcohol intake. Um, and I cannot stress that enough, especially if you are feeling like you are run down or you're feeling stressed out or you are feeling um, under the weather, you need to limit those because they are not helping your immune system. Um, and lastly, eat for your microbiome, eat that variety, get lots of diversity, get fermented foods, fiber rich foods and antioxidant rich foods because those are known to improve microbiome diversity, which is really important lifestyle factors. So we need to get enough sleep. I talked about how stress and sleep can impair melatonin and growth hormone. If you are feeling sick, you need more rest. You should not be pushing through um, late nights, big projects or hard workouts if you're feeling under the weather. Um, you do need to get enough exercise, especially if you are feeling well. I do, uh, you know, it's recommended for Canadian adults to get 150 minutes per week of moderate exercise. That means 30 minutes, five times a week of moderate exercise. That does not mean sauntering around the block with your dog. 
Um, so a lot of people are falling short on that recommendation for Canadian adults. Um, manage stress. I know that is easier said than done, especially at this um, current time that we're living through, but do what you can that's within your control. Maybe you include meditation or start a mindfulness practice, um, start yoga, breathing exercises, music, art, whatever helps you decompress and helps you cope with stress, you need to make sure you are getting some amount of that every single day. Hygiene, hand washing, very important, especially if you are you know, around little people, making sure that they're washing their hands before eating, um, washing their hands after sneezing, that kind of um, hygiene basics. And then um, chronic diseases. So just really making sure that those are well managed um, and, and managing like the substances, alcohol, nicotine, um, cannabis smoking, that all influences the immune system. So in conclusion, our immune system is made up of multiple systems, multiple organs, lots of different cellular um, functions. Think of that army. Everything has a different purpose and it all works together to protect the body. Vaccines create immune memory, which allows for um, an appropriate immune response, a faster immune response, and this helps to control infection spread. The decision to vaccinate needs to be one that is made with a medical professional's guidance. Um, everyone needs to make their own decision about whether or not they will um, vaccinate for COVID-19. Um, and that, that you, I recommend speaking to your um, physician to talk about that decision. Um, gut health plays a huge role in regulating the immune system. We know that 70% of your immune cells reside, reside within your gut um, and that dysbiosis, so imbalance between the good bacteria and the bad guys can actually impact the immune uh, function and is now being linked to autoimmune diseases. There are key nutrients that are involved in immune system function. We went over those vitamins and minerals. Quality nutrition is critical for a healthy immune system. And lastly, try and control those lifestyle factors that also impact immunity. Um, some disclosures, so I have no paid affiliations with any supplement companies or any lab testing companies or any research parties. I do own Verger Wellness Clinic um, and at Verger we offer naturopathic medicine, acupuncture, nutrition, uh, consulting and massage therapy. Um, as well as selling a variety of professional line products. So high quality supplements, botanical, herbal medicines and teas. And so thank you very much for attending today's webinar. I hope you got something out of this webinar and that you can take some of these pieces and put them into practice. And um, I hope you are healthy and well and have a great fall.